Hi, and welcome to Conversations with Des. I'm your host, Des Blanchfield. Today, I have the privilege of being joined on camera via Zoom, albeit, uh, by Prem Janal Garda. Now, Prem is the Senior Director for both Product Management and Marketing at Barefoot Division and Data Platforms Group at Intel Corporation. Prem, thanks for making time to catch up with me. Great to see you and welcome to the show. Des, thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Indeed, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time, in fact. Now, to introduce you to our audience just briefly, uh, you head up both product management and marketing at Barefoot Division, as well as Data Platforms Group at Intel. I wonder if we could maybe just start briefly with a, a quick summary of what both of those components of your role entail. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, heading global outbound marketing for Barefoot Division um, in the Data Platforms Group. And also, I'm responsible for a couple of product lines uh, in the Barefoot Division. Um, one that focuses on infrastructure analytics uh, and another product line that focuses on what we're calling computational fabrics. I mean, computational fabrics is, uh, is really interesting because what we're trying to do because of the programmability that's available in our high performance uh, switching ASICs, we are trying to bring some compute into the network so that we can help accelerate the workloads that are being processed by let's say the Xeon processors, right? So I have two product lines that I, I kind of had and then I'm responsible for uh, the marketing at Barefoot Division, yes. So I wonder uh, if we could just maybe start out with a, a general sense of what is the normal day in the life uh, for Prem like uh, with both of those roles and, and kind of, you know, what are the sorts of challenges you're dealing with day to day? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I wear multiple hats uh, in our organization. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. I interact with engineering, I interact with other teams in Intel, I interact with our customers, I'm interacting with media and analysts. So it's uh, a variety of things I'll be doing in any given day. And a lot of it is uh, just interactions with people and teams. So it's really exciting. I'm always learning something new. Um, I'm uh, put in positions where I can help people and I'm put in positions where I need to take help from people. So it's, it's really rewarding, uh, this role that I'm doing at uh, Barefoot Division and Intel. I can imagine. I, I can imagine you're jumping out of bed every day to take on some fun new challenge. Now, there's no surprise that we are currently uh, under the uh, challenge of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, a global pandemic. Um, I, I, I wonder if I could just maybe ask how you're doing. How are you coping with this whole thing with the pivot from work from home and managing the team and, and, and this amazing challenge of essentially wearing, as you said, two hats? How are you coping personally? I am coping okay, actually. I mean, it's been interesting uh, being able to work from home. Uh, there's a lot of positives and there's a few negatives. But overall, it's coming out a positive. Uh, but we're also coming to a point where you know, we need to get back to, you know, interacting with people, we need to get back to traveling, we need to get back to face-to-face -face conversations. Uh, but so far, it's been good. Um, you know, we have a lot of time to kind of not spend in commute or not spend in um, going and grabbing coffee or, you know, there's a lot of efficiencies because you, you don't have to go do all those things and you have access to uh, you know, the best food possible in home <laughs> and options. So net-net, uh, it's been quite positive, actually. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I'm pleased to hear that. And, 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 and congratulations on actually making the pivot personally and professionally. And, and also with just keeping the lights on with your team and your organization. I mean, it's no mean feat by any means. And certainly a number of people I've been interviewing have young kids at home as well because of the lockdown with schools. And, and that's been, you know, providing other challenges. But I'm glad to hear that you, you're putting a positive uh, sense on it, because I think, you know, it gives us pause to, to just take a good look at how we are going. It's unfortunate that a number of people are doing it very, very tough. Um, but absolutely, I, I totally agree with your view that we, we do need to get back to something normal soon. I think there's some uh, light at the end of the tunnel in that when we look at this, for a lot of people who are experiencing for the first time, it's a, it's a shocking experience uh, for a whole range of reasons. Uh, but we've been through this at a global level with you know, whether it's Ebola or MERS or SARS or even just the various types of influenza that break out. So, you know, there's a lot of the end of the tunnel, but whilst we're in the midst of it as we are now, it's, it's certainly challenging. Uh, there's some amazing things that have been coming out of Intel with regard to a number of uh, commercial and, and financial uh, contributions and fairly large uh, uh, components. 
uh, I remember uh, like a $10 million component being donated to a particular program and then uh, a subsequent $50 million uh, commitment. I wonder if you could maybe just give us a, a quick 30,000 foot summary of kind of what they've been and, and what your take on that is. Yeah, you know, Intel has been doing several things to kind of help combat this uh, pandemic. Uh, and in many ways, they have kind of, um, you know, started seeing this coming much earlier on and started taking steps, um, mainly with the focus of safety for employees um, and also customers. So it's been great to see them really put investment into how to fight this pandemic, uh, not only in things that they do in operations, but also in investments into uh, really into research uh, by funding research, uh, by also giving access to the patents so people can use those to develop technologies to fight this pandemic. So it's uh, it's been really um, you know, encouraging to see uh, our leadership uh, take this seriously and also take serious steps to, to fight this global pandemic. Yeah. Indeed, and I was very excited, as you said, to see some of those amazing initiatives. It's one thing to make these, these substantial contributions commercially as far as dollars go, but uh, long term, I think some of the most amazing impact is going to be opening up some of these patents and allowing innovation to drive from that. Uh, I was very excited to see the people doing things like 3D printing components for, uh, uh, you know, breathing devices and, and for face masks. And I think this is how we're going to get through this in a modern era now that we're all digitally yeah. connected. But congratulations on all of that. And I think we're going to see many more exciting things. And certainly uh, as an organization worldwide, uh, Intel would have seen uh, some very early movements in, in late 2019, even just through basic things like supply chain and factories being uh, put on hold for a short while. I wonder if we could now pivot into a couple of other little things that I wanted to catch up with uh, on um, more of a technical and business uh, side of things. Uh, firstly, uh, very exciting news recently, which um, the, the whole pandemic uh, sort of uh, noise and signal thing might have outweighed a bit, but I just wanted to put it back on the table. Um, you know, the exciting news around both the new second generation scalable uh, Xeon processor and the Atom P5900 system on chip. Um, I wonder if you could maybe just give us a, a general summary of kind of where they play into Intel's overall strategy uh, with regard to helping drive innovation in the next generation mobile infrastructure in your world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, both the products, uh, the second generation Xeon scalable processors, as well as the Atom P5900 are fantastic products. And, um, you know, when we launched them in Q1 of this year, we were quite excited about it. Uh, of course, we were going to be doing it at MWC, but we couldn't, uh, but we still went ahead and launched it. So these are really strong products, um, you know, performance enhancements, functionality enhancements, and really bringing the, the right level of performance and functionality mix to different areas in the network, right? So the mobile infrastructure is gonna go through a transformation. Uh, it's actually already going through a transformation, right? And as 5G rollout continues, this transformation is gonna take a, a faster pace. And I think P5900 and the Xeon scalable second generation processors are going to help accelerate that transformation even further, just by the fact that they deliver more performance. Um, they help mobile operators do things that they couldn't do before uh, with the previous generation products. And uh, uh, P5900 is, uh, is really cool because it's the first time we're taking Intel architecture into the base station, uh, right? So now, you're not only at the edge, you're now going into the access, into the cell towers. And being able to do that and having the same Intel architecture from the cell tower to the edge, to the core and to cloud, um, is quite uh, remarkable actually. And it's gonna help these mobile operators that are building next generation infrastructure to take advantage of this platforms um, with you know, same software, uh, there's leverage and tool chains and things like that uh, to be able to deliver services much quickly to their customers, right? I mean, now that there's a lot of bandwidth available, now that there's a lot of functionality that can be delivered to customers, having a platform that uh, you can leverage software across end-to-end uh, -end is quite powerful, actually. So we're, we're excited about that. 
Indeed, no, and, and congratulations on the both amazing achievements. And I, one of the things that I, I really loved about what I have seen so far with regard to the second generation Xeon scalable processor was the introduction of uh, machine learning capabilities into the chip. I think that's fantastic because now we don't have to offload it across the bus to a, a potentially a GPU. Uh, and and uh, the load balancing built into the, um, uh, the channel load balancing into the Atom P5900, which allows us to do amazing things with regard to software defined connectivity, uh, when we think of things like network function virtualization and, and network function virtualization infrastructure, because there's no secret that everything is a software defined infrastructure now. And I think that we're going to see more and more exciting innovations. And, and you touched on a really interesting point there that I just want to highlight that I was really excited by, and that is that we now have a situation where we've got the entire sort of uh, Intel architecture or IA uh, platform from, from the core of the data center with the high end uh, server platforms like the second generation Xeon scalable processor, all the way down to the low power uh, compute system on chip uh, out of P5900 with that IA x86 cons consistent instruction set. You know, often we've had to build stuff that works on servers and data centers and then I guess, you know, mid tier infrastructure out in the field and then things on the top of poles and wires. Now we've got this ability, as you said, to build from one code base, one build set, one binary, and it can literally migrate backwards and forth. And I think when we see that cloud native applications kind of move through the cloud from central core to mid tier in field to then the actual edge for edge networking, edge compute, these sort of you know cloud native, Dockerized, containerized, Kubernetes clustered capabilities are going to invent whole new ways to create solutions to problems that we didn't even know we could do before. Uh, you know, not so much just the basic things like ride share and maybe uh, flying helicopters uh, for one person, but, you know, autonomous vehicles like, you know, I'm just imagining what can be done with an autonomous ambulance, for example, in, in the context of what we're going through now. With that in mind, I mean, you know, I'm curious to get your take on, on another key point. I mean, telcos have truly and absolutely made this pivot now to essentially the cloud design principles, cloud design patterns, um, and in many ways they're cloud natives themselves with this whole shift to software defined infrastructure and software defined networks, and network function virtualization. I wonder if you could give us a sense from your point of view and your world within your group with both of the hats that you wear, uh, how Intel is helping drive that programmable connectivity uh, to help telco industry uh, players from uh, service providers uh, and carry service providers telcos into the enterprise space uh, and just drive that innovation and meet some of the new market demand that they're seeing out there, both from consumers and their own staff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, programmable connectivity is going to be very critical. Uh, and, you know, now and in the future, uh, you know, as compute nodes increase their performance, they're able to do more and more uh, processing. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the thing that's happening today is distributed connected compute, right? So there's compute happening across multiple nodes and they all need to talk to each other. You know, lots of data getting generated and all of this data needs to be analyzed. And that means a lot of data movement, right? And different kinds of data movement. It's just not, uh, you know, one type. Um, so, what that means is to be able to handle all this data movement for different types of applications, you do need intelligent and programmable connectivity, right? And that's where, uh, you know, our uh, you know, P4 programmable switch ASICs come into picture. So we are able to actually build a programmable fabric um, that is software defined uh, to connect all these really powerful compute capacity that you have, right? And storage capacity that you have. So as telcos and carriers are, you know, migrating to cloud native uh, or virtualization, right? So if they're virtualization, uh, virtualizing their functions, network functions, all of that is going to require really intelligent connectivity. So <clears throat> not only that, if you want to deliver new functions um, really fast, again, programmable connectivity becomes very important, right? So on the compute side of the house, you can take advantage of uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, CI, CD principles. But now you can take those principles and apply it to the network itself, because now the network also has become a programmable software-defined uh, platform. So, so really, you know, as, uh, as the carriers try to upgrade the bandwidth and deliver more services, uh, this programmable connectivity is going to be very critical. And, you know, we at Intel are able to deliver uh, solutions for this programmable connectivity from the compute um, to the network interface cards to the switches in the middle 
uh, across the board. Well, actually, that brings me to my next question. And, and firstly, congratulations on achieving this amazing, mind-boggling milestone of a 12.8 terabit per second through your or Tofino-based uh, Ethernet switch uh, optimized for hyperscale data centers. Um, firstly, I wonder maybe just you could introduce that to our audience and give them a, a, a very high level sort of overview of what that actually is and, and kind of what brought you to design and develop that. And we can sort of then dive into the journey to get to there. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so Tofino 2, uh, which is a second generation Tofino uh, P4 programmable switch ASIC, uh, can do 12.8 terabits per second, which is 32 400 gig ports in one, uh, one chip. Uh, or 12800 gigs in one chip. So it's a phenomenal amount of bandwidth. Uh, industry is already moving on to 25.6 terabits per second. So, uh, you know, the journey, <clears throat> the journey for getting to 12.8 terabits per second in the Tofino 2 started sometime in uh, 2013 when Barefoot Networks got founded. Um, more than the fact that it can do 12.8 terabits per second, what's important to, to note is the fact that it's a fully programmable Ethernet switch ASIC. Meaning, if you don't program it with a P4 program, it does not know what to do. Uh, so that's how programmable it is. And so it is allowing our customers to take this piece of silicon and build really interesting you know, network processing functions into this chip and deploy it at line rate, right? So, for example, I mean, if you are not interested in certain types of, uh, you know, tunneling uh, capabilities, you can rip those out. If you are interested in some new types of tunneling capabilities, you can code those in, right? So full flexibility in terms of functionality. Now, how did we achieve it? You know, we came up with this architecture of a fully programmable pipeline. Uh, we call protocol independent switch architecture. And uh, it involves, you know, pipeline architecture with uh, uniform uh, stages. Think of them like cores in a Xeon processor. So we have multiple of those, you know, identical stages in each pipeline, uh, which are, you know, fully compiler programmable. And we use a programming language called P4. And P4 is an open source programming language that's uh, networking domain specific. And uh, we built Tofino as a domain-specific target uh, for networking with all the primitives that are needed for packet processing, right? So, you know, programmable uh, packet processing devices existed in the past, but they always came with a cost. Either you had problems with performance, I mean, they couldn't scale up in performance, or they costed more, or they consumed a lot of power. Right, so what we've done with Tofino and the architecture that we came up with is we kind of busted all those myths that programmability requires more power or programmability comes at lower performance or it costs more. So we were able to fit all the logic for programmability into the same area of the die that a fixed function ASIC would have, right? So now we're able to keep the cost down and then we're able to deliver the same performance, or in some cases, actually even better performance uh, than fixed function ASICs, and give the full programmability that our customers need. Um, you know, we, when we were building this silicon, we always said, you know, we are not the ones who are running the networks, right? We don't know everything that needs to be done uh, in a network, but we want to give the builders of the network the best piece of silicon so that they can define the behavior of this piece of silicon and deploy it in the networks at the speed of software, right? Uh, you know, go to market is important. Um, you know, time to deploy new functionalities is important. And uh, another key, key feature that we have is full visibility into what's happening inside the device. So a lot of times, you know, when you're operating a network, when something goes down, uh, you, you need to figure out very quickly what happened, why it happened, and fix it and get your network up and running. Um, you know, with less visibility and that's available in fixed function ASICs, you can't really do that. But with our programmable switch ASICs, you get real-time full visibility into the device so you can actually pinpoint where the problem is happening, you know, get to the root cause, sometimes even prevent the problem from happening. So it's quite powerful, and we're seeing a lot of interest from um, you know, both cloud service providers as well as communication service providers for this technology. So 
uh, you'll see more and more adoption of this technology um, and uh, you'll reap the benefits because these 5G rollouts will include this technology in it. It's very timely and exciting as, as you said, you know, when 5G and other things like the Internet of Things and, and autonomous vehicles and all these things are, that are coming at us at great speed and certainly the deployment of 5G in particular, just the, the core packet network <clears throat> and all the services on top of it, the volume of data is just going to go through the roof and we're going sort of from, you know, a couple of megabit a second to 7 to 12 to 22 to now a gigabit a second uh, and, and high density and, and when we start to move from sort of traditional Wi-Fi connectivity in factories of maybe a couple of hundred devices on a Wi-Fi access point to millions of devices on a 5G access point. It's an exponential times exponential start, sort of Cambrian explosion of data. Uh, so, so not only is it timely, but it's exciting that you're well and ahead, uh, truly ahead of that curve. Because uh, I know that all the carriers that I talk to uh, have for a long time been quite concerned about their pivot to becoming cloud platform providers, running sort of five nines on those open source and, and proprietary cloud platforms meeting that switch fabric requirement. And as you said, you know, it's taken this amazing innovation you've had uh, the opportunity to build now to sort of get away from that generic all purpose switch fabric where we might have designed an enterprise switch and then try to use it telco to now having a very specific niche focused device, particularly for this pain point. I imagine that Intel must be getting some incredibly positive reaction from the carriers and service providers who are constantly trying to do two things. I think reduce their time to market for new products and services as well as increase their return on investment, and in many ways reduce the time to ROI on those things. What are some of the biggest gains that you're seeing around the space when you're talking to some of the carriers and the early adopters of the te technologies you're building? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, people latch onto immediately is in the area of visibility and telemetry. You know, how much uh, telemetry we can generate uh, from our switches, and uh, also the fact that it is, programmable. So we are seeing uh, carriers, uh, data center operators, uh, enterprises trying to implement the features that they need uh, in the network, in the silicon, right? Rather than taking a, you know, a silicon that is built to do a hundred things uh, and then only using 10 things in there, right? So we are seeing a lot of interest in being able to customize uh, the pipeline of the silicon to their unique needs. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in people trying to get full visibility from their networks so that they can keep their networks up and running. Um, and then the fact that it's fully programmable, they can plug it into their, you know, uh, agile software development environment, right? They can, you know, unleash innovation into the already built network uh, by incremental software updates. Uh, the fact that they can do it on Intel architecture platforms so that they're already doing it, they're used to it, but now inside the network infrastructure, they have for the first time an opportunity to take that same paradigm and uh, you know, reap a lot of benefits because of it. I imagine that they're quite excited also about this um, balance between their business support systems that might uh, do everything from a self-service onboarding of a new uh, customer, signing up for a new handset, all the way through to an enterprise client setting up a software-defined uh, uh, VPN uh, connectivity of some form. Uh, all the way through to, as you said, the, the management of the network where the operational support systems, the OSS component where the network is monitoring itself, self-healing, self-fixing, doing predictive analytics on where the load is and balancing. I imagine there's been a great response from them from both of those aspects because they can now deploy new services, new capabilities, use software to find uh, uh, design principles for this and deploy those very quickly down to sub-second in some cases, uh, uh, right down to, as you said, the, the silicon and the application-specific integrated circuits at port level at wire speed and better, uh, as well as ensuring that network can self-heal. I think these two things now are very well balanced and juggled inside the types of technology you're building here, which is, you know, in many ways this reminds me of, um, you know, when we think about the general purpose compute, we, you know, we saw Intel build, say, for example, general CPUs that worked well in certain areas where we couldn't predict what you're going to do. We didn't know whether you're going to word process, spreadsheet, do a bit of data analysis or watch a video. So you had to do a whole range of things. Now uh, you sort of, I guess, you know, mirrored the success you've had in high performance compute where we needed a scientific capability. So we built HPC. Now we've got a telco capability, it's sort of high performance telco, and you've well and truly gotten ahead of that curve and met it. I imagine there's some great response from both parts of the telco and carrier service provider industry with the, the business support systems part of the teams and sales and marketing with BSS and the operational component with OSS now realizing you've actually met both the requirements all in one platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you've hit the nail on its head, right? Um, we are seeing 
Uh, you know, it's it's just like we've given the keys uh, to the network into the into the driver's hands, right? So I mean, they take it and they can customize it to do what they want. Uh, and sometimes we ourselves are surprised with what they come back with, right? Because we give them the compiler, we give them the platform, and they're able to build, uh, you know, really interesting things to solve problems that we may not be, you know, aware of, right? Um, so, for example, at MWC, we were going to show um, SoftBank building a network packet broker uh, using Tofino and a software piece uh, of code in P4 that they have written. Right? And this is a functionality that they looked for in products, they couldn't find it, so they went ahead and built it themselves. So yeah, really it's all about you know, putting the, the builder and the owner of the network in the driving seat, right? So now they have full access, full control to all the infrastructure pieces that are you know, part of their network so that they can choose to implement the functionality at the appropriate location to solve the unique problems that they have. And, and, and that's quite powerful and that's quite satisfying to see actually. One of the other things that I've been getting back from, from a lot of the Kara service providers, and I had the opportunity to, to, to meet as many as 61 different companies over the last couple of years through uh, user groups and so forth. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to Ericsson's OSS, BSS user group in, in New York recently and, and speak to them. And one of the things that they were sharing with me that was they were really excited about what you're doing at Intel with regard to just not just open platforms that often are proprietary designs, but open access to it, but also open source. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe share some insight into kind of you know what you've been doing and, and, and how the carriers are responding to the amazing work you're doing with open sourcing a lot of things. I mean, we've seen like open Vino with, with uh, video processing and number of things. I imagine there's a, a component to that in some sense with what you're doing with your open platform with the Tofino switch and some of the supporting environment with that and code building that, that must have gotten a fairly good response because a lot of the CSPs are leveraging open source heavily. That's an excellent question. I mean, you know, the fact that you have a programmable platform and you have a compiler and a programming language, it behooves us to do open source, right? Um, so, you know, from the beginning when we launched the product, uh, we have always been a, you know, strong proponent, proponent of open source. We have put P4 programs out there that kind of show, hey, how this is how you implement it. And not only that, we do a lot of training uh, for P4, not only to our customers, but also out in the open ecosystem. So we are putting out some um, P4 code out there that actually shows how to run a switch or the pipeline of a switch or examples of doing layer four load balancing, uh, tunneling protocols and all of that stuff. And you know, what we're seeing is our customers are also developing a piece of code and then they're putting it out there saying like, hey, this is a problem I tried to solve and this is how I solved it. You know, it's not fully solved, but hey, I want to build a community around it. Uh, we have seen another interesting case where, um, you know, a, an engineer at, uh, actually he's a vice president at Fox, who was so excited about uh, P4 and the ability to describe packet processing in P4, he went out and wrote a bunch of P4 code, um, P4 programs and put it out there and say, hey, I'm looking for this functionality to run on a switch. So if this can run on your switch, come talk to me, right? So P4 oh. is being used for uh, putting down the requirements. Uh, P4 is being used to putting out implementations. Uh, and it's, it's been quite satisfying to see that too. You know, we put out a full program called Switch.p4, which describes the pipeline of a switch. Uh, and we put out the front end of the compiler. I mean, the back end is uh, still closed, but the front end is open. And lots of applications uh, that are built using p4 that we put out there. And we are seeing carriers as well as cloud service providers taking these open source components and building on top of it, right? So, Absolutely, open source is critical, especially the level of programmability that we've enabled with our platforms. Well, both congratulations and thank you for doing that because uh, all of those things you said there, I mean, this is how innovation is going to, to pivot and move quickly. And, and I think this collaborative community experience where uh, you know, people are contributing, even if it's just one line of code or documenting things or, or working on some of the, the just re even things like I've come across people just working on spending time reformatting code and refactoring to make it pretty. So it's easy to read for the next person. 
this is going to dramatically reduce the time to innovation instead of what, what I grew up with as a teenager of having to read a printed manual and read the specs and look at the chip and go, I don't know how to call this request. Um, I, you know, I almost wish I could go back sort of 25 years and start coding again with this capability. So th both thank you on behalf of open source community for doing that. And also congratulations on continuing that evolution of openness that Intel has had for decades and decades. I wonder if I could ask you one last question before we wrap up. Um, one of the things I'd love to do is to maybe just offer some key takeaways that are actionable for some of the carriers and service providers and telcos and, and also enterprise consumers who are now challenged with the need to sort of become mini telcos with their own comms challenges in a positive sense. And that's quite exciting because they can innovate in ways they may not have before. Um, just a general high level view, if you wouldn't mind, just as a last question. I mean, what should carriers and service providers be considering uh, in their overall approach to sort of leverage what Intel's now making possible? Uh, and particularly with the likes of your Atom P5900 um, and, and, and of course your new Switch platform um, or the, the, the second version, particularly as they look to offer increased value to the likes of edge networking and edge computing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, some of the takeaways are already being implemented uh, by the carriers. Uh, you know, really with the P5900, the, the interest that we have seen and the number of OEMs and tele uh, telecom equipment manufacturers that have taken and put out platforms. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to see. So people are already taking advantage of uh, these uh, products that we have built. Um, I think one thing uh, that carriers and uh, service providers need to do is definitely question the status quo, right? So do we need to uh, rely on, you know, let's say a legacy piece of equipment or are there any new options here that I can go deploy in my network? Uh, I mean, looking at Xeon scalable second generation products, uh, processors, as well as the P5900, it gives them uh, a range of options uh, for building platforms and building software that needs to be deployed in different areas of the network. And then again, add uh, our NIC portfolio, the network interface card portfolio, and the programmable switch portfolio, you have really an end-to-end -end view of your network. And the biggest thing is you get full control of the network, right? And that is one thing that carriers always wanted. Um, and so I would say, you know, take a look at the full Intel portfolio, both the compute side as well as the connectivity side, uh, and then think of uh, how you want to build your network. I imagine some of the key steps are, uh, and I'd love to sort of get some just uh, final uh, thoughts around how, where to get started. Uh, a lot of the times I advise people to just get their hands on some of the kit, build themselves a lab, start a development environment, and, and just sort of do some you know, MVP style approach of just getting something to work, even if they're just playing with it, get themselves like a Lego kit to sort of build on it, learn on it, use it for self-education, get some of that code you've already released and, and, and the community's released to sort of just build it and repeat that process and get that experience. Um, what are some of the basic steps they should go through to sort of go through that process to get some more information? Where should they go looking? What sort of things that they should be doing to just start, you know, educating themselves individually and, and as an organization, maybe just start to get a bit of a roadmap of how do we now adopt this technology? Yeah, I mean, in terms of taking advantage of uh, our Xeon scalable processors and the Atom SOC, uh, you can definitely go to, uh, you know, the respective product pages. There's a lot of information there. There's also the Intel Select Solutions um, you know, resource that you can go look and see you know, what are some key workloads that are being optimized for these platforms. So that gives you a, a good idea of uh, where uh, these products are applicable. And on the switch side, you, know, we can, um, you can look at uh, uh, p4.org, which has a lot of resources on programmable, P4 programmable switching and routing and any packet processing application. Um, and then also, we still have our website, barefootnetworks.com, uh, which has uh, resources on our products. Uh, so I would say, you know, those are some, uh, you know, places that you could go to look at, um, apart from calling your, you know, Intel uh, rep. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Prem, it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you so much for making time for me. And for viewers, we will have a series of links uh, below in the uh, show description with regard to not just the... Uh, uh, web portal for all Intel products and services and the uh, second generation uh, Xeon scale processor and the Atom P5900 system on chip, but also the switch platform and some of the code. So do scroll down, click on uh, show more and, and grab that detail. And we'll also have it in uh, various social media promotion posts with various links to the information. 
Prem, uh, firstly, congratulations on a number of those key initiatives, and I'm really pleased to hear that you're keeping safe at home for the moment, and uh, I'm looking forward to catching you in person when we're all allowed outside to get a breath of fresh air, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the show again soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Des. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you, and thank you for doing these things. I think they're very informative, and I've actually seen a few of your other you know, talks that are quite informative. Thank you. An absolute pleasure. Well, thanks again, Prem. You have a great day, and stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, you too.